What's up, guys? I have my phone here, my iPhone. I just thought of this with Siri, and I can talk to Siri as if it's a being in the room with me, but it's not really in the room, and it's not really in here. If I destroy this, Siri is fine. If I shoot this phone, it doesn't matter. But me, if you shoot this, if you destroy this uh, body here, then I'm done. So clearly she and I exist in some different way. And that's kind of what this story is about. Um, today's story is They're Made Out of Meat by Terry Bisson. It's from 1991, and it's a pretty well-known example of sci-fi that you may see in other collections, or if you search it on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of performances and short films, including one good one that I'm going to share with you in the post. Um, I'm not going to read the story. If you were with us in class, you heard that and um, our discussion, but this is for maybe you missed it and you want to see what we talked about, or maybe you forgot it and you're looking back at this later to make up the assignment. So in this story, we've got two characters. we got 100% dialogue, so there's no narrator telling us what they look like or anything. But we can make assumptions based on what they think is normal and what they think is not normal. That tells us about them. So they are aliens of some kind whose job is pretty similar to what uh, William Shatner talks about in the intro to Star Trek, to seek out new life and new civilizations. And it seems to be pretty peaceful. They meet new people all the time who sort of join this uh, intergalactic community and maybe share knowledge and so on. The problem is they meet this new planet with humans and they think they're pretty gross and strange and weird. So they keep repeating the word meat, which is not new. They've seen meat before and they know some people who sometimes have meat phase in their life or sometimes maybe have a meat wrapper around a more ethereal, higher dimensional structure. But nope, apparently these, these new guys that they found, these humans, are just meat the whole time, the whole way. It seems to be hard to believe. And they're a little creeps out by that. So they say, oh, the radio is, are they transmitting like raw information through some, you know, binary code? No, the radio is just recordings of this, of uh, lungs and larynx spitting out vibrations. When we have COVID restrictions in our real life, it makes us aware of the fact that when I talk, I'm not just talking. I'm sending out air and heat and water, and on the water are little organisms and virus and bacteria, and they can be good or they can be bad. But in general, we don't think of it that way. So it's kind of interesting to imagine it from another perspective. That's one of the benefits of sci-fi or fantasy is that when a wizard talks about humanity or when an alien talks about humanity, they can make statements that would seem a little strange coming from just another human. So in this story, if you want to look at it from a plot perspective, you've got characters with a motivation and a conflict, then it's pretty simple. They want to find new places and people, and they do, but they find one they don't really like, and at the end they just decide, let's pretend we didn't. Let's pretend that never happened. We'll mark it as unoccupied and just move on because we've got some cool kids that we can talk about, like a sweet hydrogen core cluster intelligence in the class nine, blah, blah, blah. And those guys maybe can talk on the fifth dimension with faster than light info coming in some other way that's not just in the short film I'm going to show. They have people chewing and slapping clapping their hands and playing music and when they present it in the way that they do it highlights that hey for us that's all warm loving stuff we like to see people being friendly and flirty and everything else but it's really kind of gross so these characters are fairly simple we don't know too much about like 
the difference between one or the other. They don't have a huge disagreement. But the angle I wanted to talk about and what we talked about in class is that sci-fi and fantasy and what they call in general speculative fiction can be a metaphor. It can be a way to say interesting things about real life using the tricks of the fictional world because no matter what you write on the page, it eventually resolves in our real brains um, as a real emotion. So for example, classic examples would be like teenage hero, maybe you're Miles Morales and you're growing new abilities and you have new powers and you got weird web liquid coming out of your wrist, but that doesn't exist in real life. Everything that matters exists in real life, though. Our audience exactly, completely knows what it's like to feel awkward, to feel like you're not really able to talk to your parents, talk to the pretty girl, understand your position in society, and feel like you're comfortable when instead your body's changing and you're growing up and all these things are scary. You can do that without the sci-fi and fantasy, but it makes it more fun and more dramatic a lot of the time. So a couple things we talked about, and a couple ways you could see this story. Again, just possibilities. I'm not saying these are like keys that unlock the secret meaning. I have no idea if the author had these in mind, and it doesn't really matter. You could see it as like, oh, these are advanced people coming to another people and making judgments on them. If a conquistador finds a new continent and says the people there, mm, I don't know if they really have the right culture. I don't know if they really have a soul. I don't know if we can invite them into our community and treat them as equals. That's one angle. Now the people in this story, the aliens don't conquer Earth, they ignore it instead. So metaphors are never perfect. Another way, and I think the way that stands out most to me is that you could get something out of this story that the way the aliens treat the humans are the way humans treat cows and pigs, calling them meat, not caring about their fears and hopes and feelings, but only about their body, treating them as sort of this gross thing. Now, again, it's not a perfect metaphor. These guys don't eat the humans. But it kind of unlocks a little angle in your brain, and you might go, oh, I never thought of that before. Another thing is this whole idea of treating humans as meat, but also looking for more and saying, oh, there must be something else. There must be a connection to the celestial transcendent something. Well, that's kind of what religions do, and you can imagine a monk a thousand years ago asking these same questions, saying, are we just meat, or is there something? more, and he would use different words, but it's the same concept. So some of the questions that I ask in our uh, little assignment here are trying to get you to think about these, and again, it's not just the right answer. It's not by saying, oh, you got to look up in the secret key of what this means. I'm pretty sure this could mean any of those, and if you asked Terry Bisson, he would say, yeah, sure, whatever. Feel free to get that if you want to get that. But he probably wouldn't have one, you know, code in mind that it's what it meant all along. Now, another thing I ask is, you know, does this remind you of any other stories? Are there any other things where sort of uh, beings from elsewhere, maybe another fantasy land, maybe another planet, maybe another time, uh, comment on humans and give us some sort of uh, judgment that we might not get on our own. Somebody in my class yesterday mentioned The Day the Earth Stood Still, which is a great 50s movie and a, I don't know if it's great, 2000s movie because I didn't see the remake, but um, where an alien comes to Earth and says, hey, you guys got to clean up your act. You got to uh, sort of change the way you live or else. And apparently he's right, but there's conflict, of course. So this is just to get us started. I'll end this video before it gets to be 10 minutes, but give it a shot.